Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is John Schnepp. Hey, what's up, everybody? I guess it was a split decision last night. Oh, oh. pun. Also here, Christian Harloff. It's nice to see everybody. I guess because I had one day off, I got fired. <laughs> uh oh. Also here, Jeremy Johns. Yes, the pathogens are going a little better. Donald Sutherland did not blow up the building. He's just contained us to this one space. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> most of us in here are still sick today, but that doesn't matter. We're ready to go with our movie talk today. And listen, one of the things that happens around here from time to time is that something drops just before the show starts, and some brand new <clears throat> Kong posters dropped. So. So we've got like two of them. I believe Tom Hiddleston tweeted one out, and I believe um, Brie Larson. Larson tweeted there. Do we have a, a, an image for that? Yes, we, yeah, we do. And it's coming in a minute here. But anyway, these there we go. Those are the yes. two posters that got uh, tweeted out. And we have a split decision around here over which one we like more. Personally, I like the one with the giant face more in the helicopter. It gives a little bit of a sense of scale. But they're both amazing. I think the rest of you guys at the table like the other one a little bit better. John, what do you think about these posters? Oh, we're calling it Apocalypse Ape, the, the, <laughs> the second the second poster, because it, it definitely has that Apocalypse Now vibe. It, it just it's uh, it's more iconic. It's not that the other poster is bad. It just it, uh, it, rem it reminded us of what it was like Dawn of the Planet of the Apes totally. with the helicopter. I, see, I think that the the second one has a little bit more scale for me because you see the, the humans kind of walking up and then it goes back. Mountains into the, in the background. Yeah, the mountains yeah. in the background. And then the, we just got those comments from the director how this Kong is going to be standing upright and he's just looming mm. and he's blocking out the sun. I mean, <laughs> that's how big he is. He's blocking out the sun yeah. and he's bigger than the mountains. And the other one's cool because you get you get a, a full shot of his face with the helicopter obviously going near him. But there's just something about all of Skull Island that we're going to see there. So it's I, I can't wait for this movie. Now, uh, Jeremy, we know that this is Michael Rappaport's number one most anticipated <laughs> yes. movie of the year. Yeah, yeah like he but said. What did these posters did, did? Do these posters do anything for you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I like the second one. I like the one with the sun in the background. I mean, the sun in the background gives it a good visual appeal. It gives it color. You see Kong standing there. He's yelling. Uh, you can't see it when it's too small, but right there, he's screaming at these three poor bastards mm, walking totally. up to him these two helicopters think they have a shot they don't no. it reminds me that second that poster reminds me of what the steelbook blu-ray will probably yeah. look like and that's what i would want on my shelf all right let's go into our first official topic of the day all right it looks as though the green hornet is getting another go at it deadline reports that paramount pictures has acquired the rights to the green hornet and tasked the accountant director gavin o'connor to direct the film will overhaul the central hero of Britt reed into an edgy one that is said to be the catalyst for a new franchise o'connor told deadline that he has wanted to make this movie ever since he became a filmmaker and holds the character in higher regard over the likes of batman and superman no release it has has been set. John, thoughts on a gritty Green Hornet reboot with director Gavin O'Connor. Okay, so here's the thing. You make an announcement that you're looking at redoing Green Hornet. I'll go, okay, that's kind of interesting. I mean, do something that Seth Rogen didn't do, which is make a comedy of it. And I didn't hate Seth Rogen's Green Hornet. I actually laughed a little bit more at that one than I thought I would. I would find it mildly interesting. You say Gavin O'Connor's going to direct this thing. Now you've got my attention. Like this dude, I think for 20 years he's wanted to do a Green Hornet movie. And you look at what he just did with The Accountant, and I love The Accountant. If he can bring those types of sensibilities to a property like Green Hornet, this could be really cool. Christian, you hear about this, what do you think? Well, I mean, my first thing is, damn it, maybe he's not gonna be doing Creed 2 now. Because I really uh, want him to do Creed 2 badly. I think he's the only, cho well, not only choice, but the number one choice. But yes, you hear that he's doing this, and, and I think Green Hornet should be treated in the more serious vein. We've already seen the comedy version. It was, I really didn't like it. It, was, it. it wasn't terrible, but it just didn't do anything. It was forgettable. This, with him attached, and to see what he's going to do, and the fact that he is referencing it and saying that it's similar to him like Batman, I want to see that version. I want to see how <coughs> this is going gonna, gonna to turn out and who he's going to get to um, play Cato, I think, would be very interesting. So, yeah, Gavin O'Connor is a guy I'm a big fan of. I still think Warrior is one of the most underrated movies ever Love made. Love Warrior. And, and so I, whatever he's doing, and you can't, and if anybody judges him off of, Jane, or Jane Got a Gun or whatever the movie was, uh, that, that's not fair because he was basically given that movie when it was just a disaster. It's like, hey, we don't know what to do with this. Can you please help us and direct this thing tomorrow? Um, so he's a great director, and this will be a lot of fun. 
What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, he does character, he does tone, he does depth. My knee-jerk reaction when I heard, like, oh, they're going to make this uh, super dark green Hornet. First of all, I, my, my reaction was like, gives a shit. Mm -hmm. It's not Batman. But then you, you start thinking maybe it'll go the Fantastic Four route, which then makes you, like, peel back a little bit. And then you think, like, well, okay. So you look at the Seth Rogen one. It didn't work out for a lot of people. I'm actually in the boat with you, John. I enjoyed the movie for what it was. I, I didn't hate it. You know, I'm not, I'm not part of the venomous crowd on it. But then, like, yeah, go that, go that other route that um, the Seth Rogen one didn't do, right? You, they went comedy, let's go serious. And then when he starts uh, talking about, oh, it's like Batman, then you start seeing the potential with him behind it and a Batman-esque superhero film in, in the way of Green Hornet. And yeah, Kato. It's like, I mean, that, that's just a great casting that you're like, there are like seven people out there. You're like, oh, they could all be Kato, but they could get an unknown. I instantly started to get excited about it. I want to say it. Yep. Yeah, I think especially coming from uh, Gavin O'Connor being a giant fan since a, he was a kid, he always <clears throat> liked Green Hornet yeah. better than any of the other characters because Green Hornet's a human being, mm -hmm. just like Batman. So those comparisons there, and that he's wanted to do this pro this prop pro this property since he was a kid, and actually bought the rights to it to make it, and 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 he had put, put pretty much put this whole thing together. Mm -hmm. um, to know that means like I think we're gonna get a really tried and true like cool interpretation of Green Hornet that we haven't seen yet not the 60s Batman version and not the Michelle Gondry, uh, Seth Rogen version, but a newer one. I would even say look at the comics that Alex Ross did a lot of the covers to. So if you just Google Alex Ross and Green Hornet, you'll see these really badass covers, then that's the hidden potential of what the Green Hornet movie could be. All right, what's next? Variety reports that Steve Carell is in talks to join the ensemble of Warner Brothers' big screen adaptation of the popular video game Minecraft. The game allows players to create their own avatars and build an environment using cubes in a 3D world as they battle nocturnal monsters. No word on the role Carell will play or who might join him in the movie that is set to bow in theaters on May 25, 2019. Jeremy, what do you think about Steve Carell joining the Minecraft adaptation? I need to see a trailer for this thing to even <laughs> know where they're going to go with this thing. I mean, it's a video game movie. I have stopped holding my breath on video game movies. I really have. Hey, if Assassin's Creed is good, awesome. I'm not holding my breath for it. I'm just going to be in the realm of reality, learning what I have learned from video game movies of the past, where Mortal Kombat is the best, and it is fun. Um, Steve Carell is talented. Um, he's funny. He can do dramatic or, or, or funny roles, but it's a Minecraft movie. It's about as baffling as Tetris to me. Like, you know, I, mean, I, I don't know what to make of this. It's, yeah, sure, I'm glad he's in it. Well, I mean, look, I'm, I'm with you as far as you don't hold your breath mm -hmm. with video game movies. We were really hoping that Warcraft would be the one. Mm -hmm. We were hoping it would be the one. And even though I enjoyed it and I had a good time with Warcraft, mm -hmm. it was clearly not the one that was going to open right. the floodgates. Now all those hopes kind of rest on Assassin's Creed, and then if that doesn't work, then maybe we got Uncharted, and if that doesn't work, then maybe it's just time to give up on the whole fucking right. thing. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so look, the one thing that Steve Carell does is it brings one magic word, credibility. Mm -hmm. You have a guy who's not only beloved by fans in the comedy stuff like that, but he's a multiple, multiple Academy Award nominee as well. He brings credibility because honestly, who's going to talk about the Minecraft movie? And now you add Steve Carell's name to it. Now suddenly it's a little bit to me like the whole Green Hornet thing with adding Gavin O'Connor. You know, you bring that name into it and suddenly it's like, oh, well, OK, what are you going to do with this? So what this does to me is it gives me at least a little bit of interest, but it makes me feel exactly like you, Jeremy. It's like I. Okay, now I want to see a trailer. Like, what kind of yeah. thing are you going to do here? What do you think, Christian? I, what it adds is the, the, the what's this factor when, you, when the trailer comes up. So you picture a bunch of people in the movie to see whatever they're about to see, and Steve Carell pops up on the screen right away. People, like you said, the credibility. They go, well, what's this? Because you see Steve Carell, and you care a little bit more because you recognize him. Because the thing with Gavin O'Connor is most people, the, the movie going on, it don't, doesn't know his name. We're excited because we, we know a lot of his work, but... With Carell, he's just got that mass appeal. So you put him in a movie like that, and it's going to get the interest and the eyes on it, but you've got to have a great trailer to go right. with it, and you got to care because I right away I go to Pixels. That's what I start right. thinking oh, about. When, when I, that's the first thing I think about, and I, Carell's obviously to but me... But there's a difference between adding the name Steve Carell and adding the name Adam Sandler. 100%, but, the, but you still... But listen, but box office-wise, Adam Sandler was still pulling in a lot of money with his movies. So, I mean, I understand what they were trying to do there. And remember, we saw a couple of those trailers, and we thought that the movie could be all right. Sure. Yeah, that's but, true. But this particular... This particular think that's scary I mean I did Carell's a better a overall actor than Adam Sandler yes but 
what is this movie going to be? That's the whole thing. I just see him sitting next to that box head, <laughs> head guy, right. and I'm like, well, I don't know. Is this the box head guy movie? I don't know what this is yet. Well, by hopefully, the, by the way, you win T-shirt of the day. Schnell. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, uh, they they have a, a little bit of uh, humans, a, a more alive action in there than just cutting away to Steve as a pixelized eight bit character that looks like that. That'll be a harder harder sell than even Lego, at least for me. Um, but if it starts out as maybe he's the dad and his kids playing Minecraft, and they both get sucked into the Minecraft move, like world, like Tron, and <laughs> then then all of a sudden you you have a, a basis to jump into the Minecraft world because you've already established Steve Carell as whatever character he's playing in the in the real world, and then that might add to some of the the fun that they could have in this Minecraft world. I honestly have zero idea. I'm building my own cave right now. <laughs> right. It's a giant 8-bit palace that I'll go hide in when this movie comes out. So basically, we need a trailer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, it is Wednesday, which means it's time for us to talk about Rewind, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is a segment of the show where we feel all a little bit older than we actually are because we talk about the films that are celebrating their 10th anniversaries this week and their 20th anniversaries this week. This one's a tough one for me. Opening 10 years ago this week, we have Casino Royale, Happy Feet, and Let's Go to Prison that I don't even remember. That's Bob Odenkirk's movie. Oh, really? Is it? Okay, and celebrating, <laughs> pardon me, their 20th anniversary this week, Space Jam wow. is 20 years old. The English Patient and The Mirror Has Two Faces. Schnapp, let's start with you. Out of those five, wow. six movies, sorry, which ones stand out to you? Wow, I mean, well, the 20 years ago, I mean, that's uh, The English Patient. It's just an incredible, moving, epic, sweeping drama. I remember, like, oh, I'm, I guess I'll go see this. It, it feels like, you know, maybe maybe it's worth seeing. And then I was blown away by it. But uh, the 10 years ago one, Happy Feet, directed by Mad Max's, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> George Miller. Thank you, George Miller, drawing a blank. Yeah, that one. And then, uh, I mean, what's the other one from 10 years ago? Just uh, Casino Royale. Casino Royale. Casino Royale. I can't, it's hard to believe that that's 10 yeah. years ago. I mean, Daniel Craig is now, is he going to make another Bond or not? I thought Casino Royale was amazing. But Jeremy? Yeah, that is kind of nuts. The Casino Royale is 10 years old. You're like, oh, that's a whole decade of a person's life. You look at Casino Royale, you're like, that's 10 years in the past for Daniel Craig. That blows mm -hmm. my mind. Um, I remember when Happy Feet came out. I still worked at the movie theater at that time. So, like, all of these are starting to uh, stack into that time. But uh, the Space Jam. I remember when Michael Jordan was making his big play, um, I, straight out of baseball. And he's gonna be a he's gonna be a movie star now, and he teamed up with Bugs Bunny. All of these blow my mind. Um, Space Jam makes me feel super, super old, and I'm older than I look, like I always say. Christian, uh, it's funny because everyone talks about Space Jam, especially when you get you get these these young kids running around like Cody and uh, Cobster, who all they do is talk about. I remember when I was two watching Space Jam. Shut up. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Space Jam, they're talking about the remake. Right. And, but yeah, that movie was, it, it also gave you that Roger Rabbit feel because mm. we hadn't had that in a little successful one in that for a while. But yeah, that, um, the Casino Royale is the one thing that's, that stands out the most. And I wish that we would have done this segment before Mark and I played Top 10 because that was a question and we guessed 2007 and I, 2006, stupid movie release dates. Yeah, the one for me is Casino Royale. It, yeah. it not only was it just a great movie, it marked the beginning of the Daniel Craig era as Bond, yeah. which has been, despite a couple of questionable ones, this has been a good run for him. Mm -hmm. I still think he's my personal favorite Bond we've ever had because he's that mix of the the, the badass Sean Connery Bond with the suave um, uh, Roger Moore Bond. And he's kind of like a nice amalgamation of the two. And that, I mean, Happy Feet, uh, I just can't believe that those movies are right. 10 years old. Yeah. All right, listen, guys. It's, we've reached part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Ashley, what do we got? Thanks to Entertainment Tonight, it looks as though Matt Damon will cameo as his Ocean's Eleven character in the upcoming spin-off slash sequel, Ocean's Eight. At the red carpet premiere for Manchester by the Sea, Damon confirmed the part, saying only that he's doing a small bit in the movie. The film will be directed by Gary Ross and centers around an elaborate heist staged at the annual Met Gala. Ocean's Eight is scheduled to hit theaters on June 8, 2018. Schnett Byrasel, Matt Damon reprising his Ocean's Eleven role in its spin-off, Ocean's Eight. I buy it, and I wouldn't be surprised if you see some other characters from the other movies showing up as well. But I mean, I'm I'm actually really excited about this. A lot a lot of times when they like get a big group of people together, like, we're gonna make this big star-studded movie. But this one with the cast that it's got, Kate Blanchett, all the different actresses, 
I'm very excited to see her. Matt Damon's going to be in it. Just adds a little more validity to the universe that they've got. Yeah, I'm going to buy it too. I don't want this to become a, a, a mashup of Ocean's 8 and Ocean's 11, mm. but to pepper in one or two little cameos just to visibly and tangibly show the connection between this world and that, I think it's a good idea, and it helps open the doors for later possibilities if they do want to do some kind of crossover action a little bit later. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, in a world of remakes or spinoffs, rather, uh, these little cameos... They, they let the audience know, like, hey, it's okay. It's still part of the same universe. Mm -hmm. It's fine. It's familiar. It's what you know, you know? So, I mean, I'm buying it for sure. I mean, just it, it, if it can give the audience that peace of mind, it might be a little fun. You know, it'll be fun to see him in there. He'll say a few things. He'll do a few quips. Um, no harm, no foul. I don't think he's going to change the course of the plot at all. No, in fact, they could no. probably film it four months after they wrapped filming and just shoehorn it in there. But, yeah, yeah, buy it for sure. Uh, it's a big buy for me because this, uh, and I've said this when they announced this thing, I'm, I'm actually, I think this could be a really good way to do this, to take a franchise that we knew before and start to spin it off into something else. And this is the way for me, when you put an all-female cast like this and someone with Sandra Bullock, this could be a lot of fun. But this is kind of what I wanted Ghostbusters to do because imagine they would have done something like this to spin off with Ghostbusters. Then when Bill Murray shows up, he's actually Vankman. Right. Yeah. I think it's a different feel with the tone and the audience. And that's what they're doing here with Matt Damon showing up. Mm -hmm. He's exactly what you said. He comes in, he shows up, you get familiar um, with it. And then they're definitely going to start to, if this thing's successful, they're definitely going to have that. Um, that next movie with oceans is, is this going to be group. called like the ocean verse as they well, start I, like I, making I more and more so of these things yeah i would assume so because she's playing danny ocean's sister yeah. so i mean this is this is a smart way to do it totally. if the first one is good and it's a lot of fun which is all we want this movie to be and you have matt damon show up that's absolutely why they're doing it so they can franchise this thing and blend both of them yeah and more to the point i was trying to make is that um if you have him cameoing as his role from oceans 11 it does let the audience also know that I'll, th this is a spin-off of sorts, but it's not replacing what you right. had before. Right. It's in the same universe. It's all fine. Although you can you can say that about anything. It's like I still have my Ghostbusters movie. If I didn't like the new one, you know, it's totally fine. Well, but, but the thing that it stops though with the Ghostbusters thing though is a problem that it, you have to continue in that timeline that you set right. up because if it doesn't right, you can go back and watch the '84 mm -hmm. version. But had they done it differently, then you would have had yeah, brand it new. Sweet. Yeah, exactly. All right, what's next? In an interview with Vulture, Hamilton's Lin-Manuel Miranda revealed he's just begun developing a secret Disney movie from the ground up, which came about during his work on the upcoming Moana. Miranda revealed that it was Toy Story 4 director John Lasseter who told him to meet with Zootopia co-director Byron Howard, and the two sparked an idea for an animated feature film. Miranda also cautioned that it could take years to bear fruit given the slow nature of an animated production. Christian Byersell, the team up of Lin-Manuel Miranda and Zootopia director, for a Disney animated film. Oh, it was a big buy. Marina is a very, very talented dude. And to see what they're going to come up with, like you said, we're not going to see anything from these guys in probably three, four years, if, if, if that soon, depending on what the idea is. But very creative guy. You can assume there's going to there's going to be some music involved, as there should be. Um, but yeah, you hear it. This, this is a, you hear his name a lot. And I just, one thing I just want to caution, make sure that we don't, overuse him overexpose him because that happens a lot of times when someone's so hot and they, they just start, you start peppering him into everything but he he was involved in the force awakens he was involved in moana now he's involved in this this is a good move i think it, it makes a lot of sense and i love zootopia it's one of my favorites of the year so yeah, bye. Yeah, well, here's the key thing, though. It's that it's not just that Lin-Manuel Miranda is a hot name right now, and, and he is with Hamilton and all that kind of crap. Very hot name right now. But that's not what the important thing is. The important thing is he's that damn good. Yeah. He is just that talented. And when you guys get a chance to see Moana, as those of us at the table have, you're going to pick him out immediately, and his contributions to that movie are awesome. The songs he puts together in there are just great, and I enjoyed it so much, and he fits so well with the Disney motif. And so he's involved with Disney in a couple of other projects as well. No surprise to me hearing he's actually sparked, helped spark an idea for a new movie. To me, this is great. For me, it's a big buy. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, Moana was great. The music in Moana was great, and Zootopia was great. This is simple math. I can keep it as simple as possible. A positive and a positive makes a positive. You know, yeah. it's like you get these two powerhouses together. How can I actually look at that and be like, no, I have no reason not to look forward to that? No, I am looking forward to that for sure. Yeah, and jo John Lasseter, that picture, just like the magic pixie dust, is like Lasseter seeing these d two different talented people and saying, you guys should get together and come up with something. So it's, it's always good to see someone who's running the show be like, I see talent there and I see talent there. Let's put them together and make some magic happen. It seems like that's what's going on. So I buy it. All right, what's next? 
20th Century Fox has released a new Red Band trailer for Why Him. The not safer work look at the R-rated comedy is directed by I Love You Man Helmer, John Hamburg, and stars Brian Cranston as an overprotective father who clashes with his daughter's billionaire Silicon Valley boyfriend. James I actually like this trailer. I really did. <laughs> Over the holidays. <laughs> Why Him opens in theaters on December 23rd. John Byers saw the new Red Band trailer for Why Him. Had absolutely no interest in this movie whatsoever before the trailer i'm really interested in the movie now i'm gonna i'm gonna admit look it, on so many levels this is a stupid trailer but i grinned and smiled a lot and laughed a lot of it I, I i can't explain it i can't quantify it except to say that i enjoyed it i don't know if it's franco's portrayal of that character he's kind of become in a lot of his <clears> movies <throat> i don't know if it's brian cranston I don't know if it's the, the Isla Fisher little sister looking girl doing it. Uh, I love that, uh, uh, whoa, Megan Malloy? M yeah. Megan Mullally. Mullally. Yeah. She, I love her. She was so good in Parks and Rec, by yeah. the way. I, I don't know what it was. For me, this trailer worked. I'm suddenly interested in seeing this movie. So for me, it's a buy, Schnepp. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm going to buy it. I had not heard one thing about it. Watched the trailer this morning, laughed my ass off, and it really is because of the star power. It's because of Brian Cranston. It's because of James Franco playing these roles and doing them so well that I think if you could have replaced him with a couple of other lesser uh, actors who didn't have that kind of a ability to portray these characters, and the trailer would have fell flat. I think it's because of who those actors are that made this trailer so much fun. Christian. I'm going to buy it, but I wouldn't be surprised if I returned it. Mm. Uh, only because like there, there are some laughs for sure. And I, this could be a movie that when you go and you see, and you're just dying because it hits you in such a, an offensive way that you're like, wow, I can't believe they went there. It was really funny. Or it could be exactly like what you're saying. James Franco just doing the same type of offensive humor they did in uh, in what's the the interview or uh, any of the movies that he's just done with with Seth Rogen. This, this is the end. This is the end. He's done a Pineapple lot. Express. He's done or... a lot of these types of roles where he just seems and he seems always seems to be like this the billionaire type character or, or or the really successful type character. But it's the chemistry with the two of them that I'm excited about, and I want to see I, the idea of Brian Cranston having to deal with this guy. It just it looks it looks like a movie we've seen a billion times before. Sure. It looks like you can pretty much guarantee exactly what's going to happen beat for beat but i am interested because i think there is some comedy to be had there i think there's some la like some sp split gut splitting laughs to be had here i just hope that that's the case i could have done without the stupid moose thing at the end it was dumb <laughs> Jeremy. All right, let's get it out of the way right now. James Franco does not know he's being filmed in this movie. That's just a fact right there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, before Brian Cranston was doing all the dramatic roles, before he was Heisenberg, the dude was a comedic actor. Right. So he has right. the chops for it. What this trailer does, it's a red band trailer. The, P the PG-13 or rated PG trailer, you know, the green band trailer. I was watching, I'm like, well, yeah, I'm sure, you know, Franco's not choice number one for the daughter, but maybe this guy's all right. In the red band trailer, it really shows you this dude is kind of a piece of shit, and I don't want him anywhere <laughs> near my daughter either. Like, if I had a daughter, I'd be like, hell no. You're staying away from that <laughs> right there. And that's what I loved about this red band trailer. It really shows you where they're coming from, why Cranston's like, no, not at all. Um, I'm hoping that this is like 21 Jump Street or Ted, where like you come out of it like, oh my God, that was one of the best comedies I've seen. Buying it, and if I regret it, oh well, but I have hope. So here's the thing. I walked into the studio a few minutes before we are going to shoot to get my stuff set up, and Wendy and Ashley were over at the table watching it, and it looked like they were keeling over from laughing. So I, I Ashley, start. what did you think about the trailer? Oh my gosh, I thought it was hilarious. It looks just like a good time at the movie, just like an enjoyable film. And I mean, the cast is great. Brian Cranston and James Frank go and I was reading that Adam Devine and um, Keegan Michael Key who I love if you have not seen this trailer <laughs> Christian said it was the stupid part but oh my gosh me and Wendy died at this one scene you have the to check moose it part. out the, the moose, moose part the moose part so stupid <laughs> Wendy it looks fantastic and just like you said John like when I first read about the story I was like I don't really care and then Mova was watching so I hopped in there to watch it with her now I actually want to spend my money and time at the theater and go and see this. Though I do worry that like with a movie and a trailer like this, I hope they didn't use up all the jokes that right. are already in, in the trailer and then just recycle in the movie and we're yeah. like, okay, that's all the funny parts. All right, what's next? THR reports that OJ Made in America director Ezra Edelman is set to direct The Ballad of Richard Jewell, his first ever narrative feature about the 1996 Atlanta Olympics bombing. Based on a 1997 Vanity Fair article, the story follows security guard Richard Jewell, played by Jonah Hill, who discovers a pipe bomb at the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. Jewell's quick thinking helped minimize the damage, but soon reports revealed that the FBI was looking into Jewell as a suspect. The public soon turned on the hero, even after he was 
formally cleared by the FBI. Jonah Hill will also produce alongside Leonardo DiCaprio. No release date has been set. Christian Barcel, director Ezra Edelman, directing Jonah Hill in The Ballad of Richard Jewell. Oh, huge buy for me. This sounds very, very interesting. I love the production, the producing team of, of Hill and Leonardo DiCaprio. They, obviously, they've, they've worked together in the past. They're working together now, producing this thing. Jonah Hill, it's funny, 10 years ago, you want to talk about Rewind, if you would have told me that he's doing a movie like this, what is Jonah Hill doing in these movies? Get him out of here. Right. Not now. Um, with, with Wolf of Wall Street, I missed it. What's the, the one you guys raved about that he was in this oh, year? Yeah. Uh, the one with Miles Teller. With Miles oh, Teller. Yeah. Yeah, the War about dogs. the arms War dogs. Dogs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. really good. About him that. I mean, obviously, Moneyball, he can do this. He He's going to be able to do this. And I think that he, because I would have been worried 10 years ago he's going to play this comedy to it, and he's not. The fact, I love the story of this security guard, <coughs> hero at first, then enemy, and then back again. Now they're making a movie about him. Obviously, it's going to be. Um, uh, they're going to show the true light of this this movie, but just the 96 Olympics and what happened there with that bombing, I think more people need to know about the story. And after seeing what, what People vs. OJ, I mean, that was like yeah, a the full job on, he did that on was that. a full on movie. A straight movie, like what was that, like t- 10 episodes? I mean, was oh, it? I can't remember. Whatever it was, it was, it was a full movie that you were just hooked on. He, he, he can tell a story, he gets great performances out of his actors. So, yeah, it's a big buy for me. Here's the thing the, the st- the, I'm going to buy this strictly because of the story itself. When you look at the story of this dude, Jewel, being a hero ruined his life. I mean, I don't know if it was 30 for 30 that did that documentary on him or if it was a CNN, but there's a little documentary you can find on on him and what happened, and it's so crushingly heartbreaking when you see that being a hero turned on him, mm. and it, it just crushed him and it ruined him. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what the media can do, and even after it finds out, oh yeah, he's not the one who did it, and but that didn't matter at that point, damage was done. It's kind of a crazy story, and you're right. Being told by this guy, with these guys on board to produce, I, I don't see how you don't buy. So for me, it's a buy. Shnep, what do you think? It's a buy for me too, especially with all the things Christian said about Jonah Hill. I mean, you know, he's become he's coming to his own as like not just a comedy actor, but an actual real actor. So I'm looking forward to seeing his portrayal of this character or this actor, this real person, and um, and finding out what you know as far as from the perspective of this biopic what really happened i mean because we you know we can read and see different articles but sometimes movies do that kind of like shining a perfect light on something what do you think jeremy this is ezra edelman yeah okay yeah the, the uh, oj thing that he did was oj simpson made in america oh he didn't which was do a different uh, documentary uh, 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 okay. haven't seen it but i was at a screening in seattle and every critic there was like this thing might mm. put the academy in a position to have to rethink Best Picture because they were like, it's the best thing I've seen this year. And so it's a, uh, I want to see the documentary, haven't seen it, but I love the fact, miming everything you guys said, Jonah Hill, DiCaprio, um, the story of what happened here and with this guy who made something that is supposedly so great that I haven't seen, um, want to see it all. In fact, I, and I now am motivated to go back and watch that O.J. Simpson uh, documentary because I really want it. Well, look, guys, we do this show live every day, Monday through Friday. And as such, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. If you're watching us live right now, start tweeting us some questions. Simply follow us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and start firing them in. And Wendy will pick a couple out to read at the end of the show. I also want to remind you that this isn't the only show on Collider Video today. Earlier today, the newest episode of Nightmares dropped. So if you're into horror, make sure you check out John Schnepp is on that show. Of course, with Clark Wolf and others. Make sure you can go and check that out. All right, guys, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address in the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send out in your questions. Maybe you'll see it on Movie Talk. Maybe you'll see it on Mailbag on the weekends. Send them on in. Ashley, what's in the mailbag today? Cam writes, hello from Manitoba, Canada. Woo. If Disney does buy Netflix, what are the chances of a Netflix Star Wars show? <laughs> I would love to see a darker Star Wars show, perhaps set in the old Republic era, focus on the Sith. With any luck, we could see Darth Revan brought into new canon. Love to hear your thoughts. Still feel this way that I have about every time the question's asked. I don't want a Star Wars show. Don't want it. I, it's going to dilute the universe. I like it as a movie property. When you look at, it, especially, I keep bringing this up, and it's I've never seen it countered yet. When you look at the Netflix shows, right, for, for the Marvel Netflix shows, those are done on shoestring budgets. Yes. Like, and that's part of the charm of those shows. That's kind of part of what makes them so kind of cool and different mm-hmm. from the cinematic universe. But they are low budget shows. You cannot do a Star Wars show low budget. You just can't. Um, so like me personally, as a diehard lifelong Star Wars fan, I don't want it. Now for the complete opposite point of view, 
Let's go to Christian Harlow. Yeah, I couldn't disagree with you more. Um, you can absolutely do a Star Wars show for that type of budget. If you were going to do that, that the bounty hunter show that you were gonna, that they had posed, you could do, you could absolutely do that. You could put it in the darker thing. I don't think they're going to actually. I, I do think there will be a Star Wars Netflix show if this happens. But if not, I think we're going to be stuck on them putting it in ABC, which I don't want to see happen. I think that you can do more with the world if you put it in Netflix. Now, I agree with John that if you went, if you tried to do a full on big old republic series you might be able to do it with uh, depending on the kind of budget that disney wants to spend on it because a star wars series people will watch you absolutely will i don't think it'll dilute the universe i think that especially if you're going to go to the old republic if they decided to do that it's opening up i think that the old republic could be their version of game of thrones scaled back obviously by about 100 percent. but you could you could do so many new things to where you don't have to connect everything to the movies that it's complete it, it feels so much different because it takes place you know you can watch Jedi Council for the full explanation of all this stuff because I don't want to lose people that aren't in Star Wars, but Old Republic is supposed to take place, the old stuff, 3,000 years Thousands ago. Thousands of you years. You don't have yeah. to do that anymore because that's not canon anymore. You can change it up. You can make it uh, 500 years ago, 1,000 years. Whatever you wanted to do, they have a new platform. So I do think that Star Wars will do a Netflix series if Netflix, if Disney buys Netflix. I don't necessarily think it will be the Old Republic. I think it could be something else. I think they could do small scale if they went... Uh, if they wanted to focus on brand new characters and not make the universe smaller by introducing you, depending on where they want to make it, they could put it in any time period. It's after episode six. It's before episode four. They, there's so much that they could do. It just depends on what happens. Jeremy. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with Christian on this one, John. I'm sorry. They actually do have a Star Wars show. It is Star Wars Rebels, so they are actually doing Star Wars TV. But I agree that when it's live action, it'll take more of a budget. But as someone who watched and loved Firefly, if you watch, if they do a show that's all about the smugglers or just bounty hunters, a lot of Firefly takes place on the ship set or on a planet. Mm. And in between, all the well, all the Star Wars right. don't really happen, but you don't need that if you're doing a personal story about a smuggler or a bounty hunter or someone who's out there doing something, a personal story about their, their this, that, and the other, you know? It was like Battlestar Galactica. Right, right and right. Battlestar Galactica. That one looked like it had the budget of budgets at the time. I don't know what the Battlestar Galactica budget was, but you can do that. You can have people on a ship dealing with their personal shit and their politics among their fleet, and you won't have to do all the Star Wars stuff. I think it is possible, and I would like to see it on Netflix if it happens. Sure. I would love to see a Knights of the Old Republic uh, on Netflix, and I, but I would keep it to like eight episodes, make it really special. Right. And that's, a, that's the thing. You don't want to dilute Star Wars, and we saw that happen way before Force Awakens. It was like all these parody shows right. and making fun of it left and right. That's when I got tired of it. I was like, every, it became a joke within a joke within a joke, and it needed time off, and now it's back in a really cool way where we can take this franchise seriously. We don't need Vader and, and the Emperor ordering Chinese food on the phone. Ah, you got my order wrong. <laughs> or any of those parody <laughs> things. So I think it dilutes it. And I think if Netflix does the right thing, they're going to take it with a, not like a heavy gravitas, but have having fun with it, but like keeping it special. So keeping a limited series, even if it went to ABC and they and they did like a bounty hunters, like the underworld series that Lucas was developing, like 52 scripts are like sitting in a vault somewhere. Even if they made that and just made it a six episode thing and did the IMAX treatment that like they're doing with Inhumans and they released two of them for a month. It's there's a way to keep Star Wars special, even if it is in your home screen. I think that's the way to go. All right, what's next? Tim writes, I'm looking forward to watching Doctor Strange, but I'm not sure how it will fit into the rest of the MCU. Someone with all this power should have no problem taking on the villains that rest that the rest of the Avengers would face. Now that you all have seen the movie, what are your opinions on this? Thanks, I love the show and all the shows that Collider produces. One of the really good things they did with Doctor Strange, <coughs> pardon me, was that they didn't overpower him in the movie. Like, let's, let's put it this way. A uh, common thug sneaks up behind Doctor Strange and shoots him. Doctor Strange is going to die. <laughs> it's not like the Hulk where somebody walks up behind the Hulk and shoots him. The, bolt, the bolt's going to bounce off him. I mean, so they, they did a really good job of keeping vulnerability with the character while introducing really cool, spectacular, unbelievable powers. Having seen the movie, I'm going to tell you that Doctor Strange is very powerful, but he would face some problems. If you want to do sports analogies... There are a lot of villains in the MCU that would pose particular problems to Doctor Strange at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's how I believe Marvel keeps their characters interesting. You know, even if you look at the Hulk, right? What makes him interesting on, on screen is that physically, he's unbeatable. He's simply unbeatable. 
but they give him weakness. Like he's 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 just all about his rage and he can't control himself. Blah blah. So they keep the Hulk interesting by not just making him super powered. They give him weakness at the same time. We've seen Iron Man have vulnerabilities. We've seen Captain America have vulnerabilities. We see Thor have vulnerabilities. And that's how Marvel keeps their characters really interesting. That's always been the challenge with Superman. Like one of the things with Superman is well, how can you tell interesting stories with a guy who's basically God? Mm. Well, how can you do that? And some of the best Superman stories are the ones that capitalize on the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities of Superman. So I don't think we're going to face that problem with Doctor Strange. Schnepp is somebody who loves this movie. Sure. How would you answer that? Uh, yeah, I don't think we'll f we'll find those problems. I think you know if if Doctor Strange was facing off against Loki, they both have different kind of like magical science related. Uh, superpowers, so if you want to say that, but um, once again, yeah, Doctor Strange is just a human being, just like Hawkeye, but uh, he didn't do the train. Hawkeye doesn't have the training that Doctor Strange has, like open vortexes into other dimensions. But I think he's not overpowered. It's just the way you look at his powers. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, he's super powerful in the pie piece that he has among mm. his pie piece. But like you said, so is the Incredible Hulk. So is Thor for him. So so everybody is really powerful given their power. But if someone opposing, like if if Thanos gets one of those Infinity Stones and punches Strange in the head, he's out. He's gone. He's he's totally dead. Strange does uh, like because he can teleport. So can Nightcrawler from X Men. You know, but he's not super overpowered. You know, so uh, I mean, it, it all it it does have to do with how he deals with his stuff and his time. He does have a power that he can do without spoiling the movie. But it's one of those with all magic comes with a price thing. So it's like, you can't just spam that and mm -hmm. do that. You might actually rip reality in half. So in that, <laughs> they've toned it back like, well, he could, but he can't do it. So uh, yeah, it, it, they've executed it perfectly to where he's every bit as powerful as Thor, but also has weaknesses like Thor. What do you think, Christian? Well, it's funny because I felt the same way as the viewer, but then I talked to the sweat sweatiest sweatiest of sweats over <laughs> there, and he, uh, he he convinced me, though, that of basically what you guys are talking about, and it's... All Thanos needs to do is get a, a good little thief, and the yeah. thief sneaks into Doctor Strange's place, and you know, next thing you know, oh, I don't have those tools anymore. I can't do that. Yeah. But it's, that, that's really all it takes. So you're right, and he's he's not he's he's more vulnerable than, than most. He just have, he just has to guard his stuff. So it, it's just a matter of uh, how they're going to do it. I think there's absolutely ways to do it because I felt the same exact way. I'm like, well, why is he just he's just going to be able to do exactly what he just did to Shamu or whatever the thing's name was? <laughs> and, and, Shamu. And, and then he's going to, you know, he could do that. Like, well, no, no, he's not going to do that because this is a different foe. And yeah, so it, there's ways to do it. I, they, they did so. I think there'd be a very interesting head-to-head uh, -head thing between him and Loki. I, th I, I would actually yeah. like to see Doctor Strange and Loki with the differences in their powers. That would be kind of interesting. All right, guys. I said we'd save some time for your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? First one comes from Steffos, who writes, Beauty and the Beast trailer broke the record for the most views in 24 hours with 127 million. Wow. Your thoughts? Wow. I Look, I, I'm on record. I loved it. I absolutely loved that. The trailer actually gave me chills. Um, I, I just really appreciate it. So... I mean, I'm glad it broke the, uh, what was the previous record again? Uh, 50, 50 Shades of Grey 2. Yeah, 50, ah, the second. Yeah, good. Which broke, <laughs> which broke the record of Star Wars right. The Force Awakens. So uh, this is a good one for it to break. So I, I'm really happy about it, Schnepp. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't really care that much about the record breaking, but if it, you know, Beating the Beast holds it now, it's better than Fifty Shades of Grey. I thought it was a good trailer, so good. I'm glad. Jeremy? I'm your local fucking idiot who didn't actually do a review for the trailer. That's all I hear. I'm yeah. like, oh, I should have done a review for that one. What was I thinking? Damn it. But uh, no, I'm glad. I mean, you know, anytime people can, uh, can get happy and enjoy a trailer with some of that Disney magic, I'm good with that, so I'm glad. Well, as far as the question of what does it mean, uh, it, it means that people want to see this movie. Yeah, it, it means there's incredibly high interest. It means there's a reason why the the original animated was the only, was nominated for best picture. It's a movie that and 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 why the Broadway play did as well as it did. Yeah. It is a story that Disney crushed, and it looks like they're doing it again. Remember when they announced this movie and they started announcing the casting? Like, has there ever been? Perfect casting. Well, we're looking at it. You look at everything we've seen, and then you hear the music as soon as that thing starts, oh. and it looks great. That being said, anyone that agrees with Mark Ellis that this thing will make 200 million opening weekend is a crazy person. There's no mm -hmm. way it makes 200 million opening weekend in March, and Mark Ellis is going to be wearing that Predator costume. Think, think <laughs> of this though. Think of this though. If it got 100 million hits, and every ticket costs about 10 bucks. And it got 100 million hits in one Doesn't day. Doesn't mean everyone's going to see it. Also the same, because look at this Fifty Shades of Smell. Hey. That thing That thing also uh, didn't do well. Uh, yeah, but people uh, were hoping to see some porn. 
Yeah, uh, but yeah. even so, they didn't go to the movies and it, it didn't do. I'm all. not disagreeing with you. Yeah. I'm just saying Mark Ellis. Let's, let's put it this. Let's, <laughs> let's put it this way. Before I saw those numbers, all right, I would have bet Mark Ellis a million dollars that that movie would not hit 200 million opening weekend. No, you bet him 800 grand. I am not willing to bet him a million dollars at this point. Okay. Maybe a thousand bucks. I would bet. <laughs> a million dollars. But I don't know that I'd be willing to bet a million bucks on it anymore because, like, because like the guys are saying, the interest in this movie is sky frickin' high. I think a lot of people were, were going to the Fifty Shades trailer, number one, for a lark, uh, for a bit of a laugh. Some people were hoping to see boobs, I guess. Mm. I don't know. And then, and, and just some kind of morbid Same curiosity. Same thing with Beauty and the Beast. But no, I think with Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> I think there is a deep-rooted, real solid interest and excitement for this movie. And everything I have seen has been bonkers good so far. I don't disagree. So, I mean, look, do I think 200? Yeah. Mi- no. Right. I, I, but I think like 140? Yeah. That What's, is not out of the question at this crazy point. At What's it opening against? March? I uh, haven't checked. Okay. I haven't double checked. I'd, li- I'd like to personally congratulate everybody at this table for talking about how this thing is like, you know, it's like it, it, it's a deep rooted story and you never use the phrase tale as old as time. Good job. Good job. Good right. job. Good job. <laughs> I, I can't. I did. I did the other day when I was talking. About it. I couldn't resist. But OK, actually, well, Ashley and Wendy, you guys did a reaction the other day to the trailer, which you can find up on our YouTube channel. What did. Like, Wendy, let's start with you. What did you think about the trailer? Hater sure you corner. want to ask the hater corner over here? I yeah. know, right? Hater <laughs> corner. <laughs> Look, I think the problem with for me is that I'm holding on very hard to that classic animated movie, and I'm having a hard time letting go, so I'm comparing it really hard. So, like, I feel like I'm nitpicking at it because I want it so badly to be good, but I think the casting is perfect. I think the servants needs work, but the set design, the music is perfect, and I am still going to buy a ticket to see this movie. Ashley? Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. It's like when you read a book that you love, and then they create a movie on it. You have high hopes, you have this idea in your mind, and when it kind of veers from that, you're a little bit shook, but, like, I'm still excited to see it, and, um, yeah, it be- beating the record in front of, I think, 50 Shades Darker and um, Star, Star Wars. Wars. What, like, a random like top three mix of, th- of um, different <laughs> yeah, movies. But, um, yeah. I'm into it, yeah. All right, what's next? Marvel DC News writes, my university is asking me to write a paper on a movie to do with memory and time travel. Any good suggestions, please? Memento. Mm. I mean, that's not, not that's not time travel, but yeah. if it's one or the other, it's Memento would be a great one. Memory? Sunshine, is that the one? Oh, well, that's a good one, but it, I don't one? think it has to do with Wait, I mean, s- Sunshine would work. I, I would go see Arrival right now in theaters, oh, and yeah. that, that's a good one. I, I would say Interstellar is a great one that deals with the, the dimension of space-time for sure. Yeah, um, out of the ba- again, I don't want to – I would just – Ryan Johnson's other uh, – uh, oh, Looper. Looper. Looper, yeah, yeah. Looper is a good one. All right, let's take two more. Okay, next one comes from Ben Hyde, who writes, If Ghost in the Shell is successful, what anime do you want the studios to do oh. next? Keep on being sexy. <laughs> Akira. I want to see Akira. Yeah, I mean, Akira, they, I know they've, they've been trying to get Akira done. For 20 years. For a finally. long time. I, and I think it's, it's, it's still on the development table. I think they're at some point in the development of it. That's really big. Um... I mean, it's not classic anime, but I talk all the time about Space Battleship Yamato, mm-hmm. or also known as uh, Star Blazers. I mean, I, I want to. I know there was an Asian live action version; it wasn't that good. Right. But I'm dying to see an, uh, a real version of that. What do you think? Akira for me was the one that I mean, because DiCaprio had it for a long time, and I don't, I don't know if Appian Way still has it. But I think I, he still has. I it. I think he still has it. I, and I think that that'll probably be the one that's announced if this one does well. I'm gonna be blurring the lines between video games and anime, but I'd like to see Zone of the Enders, my friends. Hideo Kojima's produced classic. Yes, Zone of the Enders with Jehuti. I want to say it. All right, last question of the day. Okay, la- uh-oh. uh-oh. Okay, my computer's back. It's okay now. All right, <laughs> Phil Van Foom writes, if Jin Ursel survives above or below 65%, we see her in episode eight. Okay, Great. well, first of all, chance Jin Ursel survives this movie, zero. Uh, <laughs> but if she does survive, zero. I that she popped really? up in episode eight. You guys all think she's gonna die? I would say one oh, percent chance say. she lives, zero uh, percent yeah. chance. I'd say, I'd say she dies. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the fact that we've never seen her is just really. Man, perplexing. she's totally alive, living a good life. I don't know. <laughs> unless, That's a bummer. Unless she gets captured, gets thrown into some cell in Coruscant just to get like throw away the key, and then somehow she pops out. Uh, yeah, but I'm with you guys. If I had to put my money gun to my head, it's a, I think she dies. But oh. if she does live. There'd be no reason to not show her in one of the later episodes, so episode eight or nine, if she lives. Well, I hold on. If, well, first of all, if she lives, yes. if, if she lives, if. 
what, we were 30 or 40 years later. Yeah. There's lots of reasons not to have her pop up in a later uh, I mean, episode. I mean, well, 30 or 40 years later. 30, 40, 40, 40, 40. She'd be like 60 something, maybe? She'd be 60. Yeah. In her 70. I don't the know. She's in her realize, prime. And what you got to realize about Rogue One is that when we, we all, we've heard that it ends around 10 minutes before episode four starts. Yeah. That's a pissed off Vader. That is a pissed off Vader mm. looking for those plans. Right. And this is the group that gets the plans. He's going to find them. He's going to kill them. Yes. And then he's going to go try to find Leia. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I like it's going to sense about. We're all, we're everyone hypothesizing about, that's on the hypothesizing on the 1%. 99% Vader rips her spine out. Mm -hmm. I am in saying. the 1%. Jen Erso forever. She's going to live. No, she's not. She's going to die. She is Yoda. Okay. That'll do it for us, guys. This is Dumb Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank the guys at the table with me. First of all, over there, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can find me at DesignerCon this weekend. If you're in L.A., Pasadena, come get some vinyl toys. My booth, 804. Come on by and say hi. And uh, on a little show that's on our channel today. Yo, yo, check out Nightmares. <laughs> Thanks, John. He's always got to remind me. I forget stuff. Nightmares. It just dropped this morning. Heroes dropped yesterday. Watch both of those. Mr. Jeremy Johns. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Jeremy Johns. Facebook at Real Jeremy Johns on Monday through Thursday right here with these fun folks. Mr. Christian Harloff. You can find me at Christian Harloff, both Twitter and Instagram every Thursday. Collider Jedi Council. Yesterday, the uh, Wolves of Steel and Real Rejects matches up for Schmodown. Check that out. But then this Friday, no singles match, but we're going to be doing a top 10 ranking special. We'll show you everything that's happening with Ooh. the rankings of the singles and in the team so everybody's caught up before we go back into production next week. Of course, Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And Wendy Lee. On YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can simply find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just follow me at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye bye Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.